Hi, I'm Shay Taylor, and welcome to the Teach Me One Thing podcast. I started this to satisfy some of my curiosity about a variety of subjects. So what I do is I interview people that are practitioners and experts, and I ask them to teach me one thing in under 30 minutes. I hope it's as fun and entertaining for you as it is for me. I'm going to be releasing one of these every week, so make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Social media is everywhere around us. It dominates the news, drives political processes, and directs what we see and how we feel. So when I heard that US politicians were pushing to modify some law called Section 230, I wanted to find out more. That's why I reached out to Preston Byrne. Preston is a partner at Anderson Kiel, and he focuses on working with early stage tech startups and VC firms on everything from corporate transactions to IP and cross-border issues. He's a fixture in the crypto community and has almost encyclopedic knowledge of how the space has developed, as well as the legal implications for developers, investors, and customers of crypto products. I turned to him because I wanted to get the point of view of someone that actually knew what the law said. Almost everything else I read on the internet was clouded by opinion. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Hi, Preston. Uh, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hey, Shay. I'm all right. How are you? I'm good, dude. I'm good. Uh, so like we discussed, I wanted to understand a bit more about what Section 230 was. Can you explain what it is exactly? Yeah, so Section 230 is uh, is law, and uh, it's named after the section of the U.S. code uh, that, that it's part of. So it's 47 U.S. Code Section 230. And basically, according to the sort of leading scholar on this, a guy named Jeff Kossoff, he calls it the 26 words that created the Internet. So it's a particular rule that has to do with liability for user-generated content on the web, which legal scholars generally agree is, is responsible for the birth of the modern Internet. Okay, and so can you like give me like a rundown like what it says or some overview about what it says? Yeah, sure. So there, there are two operative provisions to Section 230 that are, that are the ones, at least, that most people talk about. The first one is 230C1, which is, has to do with the treatment of a publisher or speaker of, of content who's actually saying something. And the other one is 230C2, which really has to do with content moderation uh, on the web. So the first one, 230C1, and I have it here in front of me. Uh, and I'll read it out because I think it's helpful to read through it once and then kind of explain what it means. So 230C1 says, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So that's a lot of legalese, right? So interactive computer service is defined, information content provider is defined. But basically what it means is, so if you're providing an internet service or you are using an internet, an interactive computer service like Facebook, you're not going to be treated as saying stuff that other people are saying on the website. So this is somewhat different from the usual position that publishers find themselves in. So if, for example, I write a letter uh, to the New York Times and I say in the letter, you know, I think uh, Donald Trump is a big fat moron, you know, just for sake of argument. And Donald Trump doesn't like what he said, he can, or what I said, he can sue me for defamation, and he can also sue the Times for publishing that defamatory material. And that's something that we see a lot with newspapers. When a writer publishes something, the newspaper gets sued. So in recognition of the fact that internet companies needed to be protected from this in order for the internet to grow, Congress basically came up with Section 230, and it was actually in response to a case where Prodigy was sued by Stratton Oakmont, which was the uh, the securities uh, bucket shop that was uh, the subject of the movie Wolf of Wall Street. So Congress basically came up with this provision, and it says that if you're using a service or you're providing a service, uh, and someone else uses that service to say something, you are not treated as having said it. So if someone, for example, quote tweets a tweet of mine and they say something which is defamatory, people can't sue me for the defamation if my speech wasn't defamatory. Similarly, if I post something on Twitter which is defamatory, someone can't sue Twitter for the defamation. And defamation for those users, so that's libel, slander. Basically, if you say something that's untrue about another person that's likely to lower their, their reputation, uh, in, in the estimation of right-thinking people, that is defamation, and that's a cause of action in most of the um, common law countries. You can't say bad things about people if they're not true. 
um, generally speaking. So, so that's 230C1. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that explains a lot of things. So what's the controversy around it today? So 230C1 is controversial because people really don't understand it. it it's an immunity, right? So this basically says that when someone's talking on your website, you aren't treated as someone who is liable for that speech. Of course, then there are some platforms which encourage outrageous speech or offensive speech or take sides in speech. So they'll moderate one side, but not the other. And people don't like the fact that the platforms are able to make their own decisions about this. And as a consequence, they're immune from suit for virtually everything else that's on their website. There's another issue, which is that these platforms, they thrive on engagement. And engagement in eyeballs tends to bring out the worst in people. And so as a consequence, there is an argument to be made that they're monetizing low value speech, uh, which sometimes can be very harmful to other people. So cancel, you know, cancel culture, mobs and that sort of thing. Um, and so these platforms are benefiting from this and encouraging all of this sort of socially very corrosive um, speech. But at the same time, they are not liable for it, even though there are victims of online outrage mobs and the rest of it who lo whose lives are destroyed as a consequence. So I think there, there's a bit of a worry that these platforms uh, are hiding behind that particular section of the statute to promote ideas that certain you know, parts of the population find objectionable. In particular, the conservative wing of, uh, of American politics doesn't like this provision because they say they believe that when Twitter, for example, acts to edit content, they, quote unquote, become a publisher and not a platform. So that's something you'll see a lot. People say, well, Twitter, in this instance, by censoring. So Steve Bannon, for example, he was a right wing American political figure, was banned from Twitter today. And so people might say, well, they banned Steve Bannon. And by making that editorial decision, they're acting as a publisher and not a platform. And OK, fine. Maybe if Twitter were a newspaper, that would be true. But the fact is, even if Twitter were a newspaper, this doesn't really have to do with whether you're a publisher or a platform. It has to do with if you're a provider or user of an interactive computer service. So the New York Times, which is unambiguously a traditional publisher, uh, could have a comment section on its website. It used to have one. It no longer does. Uh, where users said all kinds of nasty things. And even though the New York Times is an editorializing publisher with some very definite uh, points of view that are expressed on its pages, it would still benefit from the protection of this section. Similarly, Twitter and Facebook are publishers in the plain and ordinary meaning of the term in that they publish content for other people, but they're usually not the ones doing the talking. So if there's a misunderstanding in how the how the statute was designed to work and what it does. So people think that Twitter, when they do something like kicking someone off the platform or using an algorithm to promote a particular point of view, they regard that as being uh, out of bounds for the purposes of the statute. But in fact, it's nothing of the sort. The, then I think this is actually a good segue to go into the second part, right? So we know that 230C1 tells us that if you're using or providing an interna interactive computer service and some other jerk comes onto your service and says something stupid, you're not liable for what he said. But the second part of 230, which is 230C2, says that no provider, and I'll read it again, the text in plain language, and then we'll go into what it means. It says no provider or user, right? So provider or user, pretty clear, of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of A, any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected, or B, any action taken to enable or make available to you know, information content providers or others, the technical means to do so. So basically what this means is if you are, again, a provider of the service, i.e. Twitter, or a user of the service, i.e. anybody else, and you've got some, you know, some feature which can restrict access to material which you find otherwise objectionable, whether or not the material is constitutionally protected. So if the hide button on Twitter is a good example of this. If someone you know, appends a reply to the bottom of your feed and they say something you don't like, you can hide that reply and make it disappear. Um, then you are not going to be held liable civilly for doing so. And similarly, if Twitter does that, if they hide a tweet, if they ban your account, if they do whatever, there is a voluntary action taken in good faith to remove material which Twitter finds objectionable and they can't be sued. So what you have is two, now you have two prongs, right? So we talked about that immunity in the first place, which is you're not liable for what other people say on the internet. That's the first piece. And the second piece is you're not liable for restricting access to material you find objectionable. 
which basically puts the control of the experience, A, in the user, and B, on the platform. It says to platforms, you're not going to be held liable for other people's speech, so you can promote other people's speech as much as you want uh, by allowing them to use your platform to speak all that they want. But at the same time, if that speech is objectionable, we're going to respect your right not to be used to promote and promulgate that speech. And so these two provisions basically mean, it basically means that if you're Twitter, you have absolute freedom to allow people to speak on your platform and say anything that's constitutionally protected, and in some cases not constitutionally protected, with limited exceptions. And B, if you decide that you're going to moderate, this gives you maximal freedom to moderate. You don't need to worry about calling in the lawyers anytime that you remove some content that you find objectionable. So someone could turn around and say, well, you know, you're interfering with my good work. I've been using this as a service. And by deleting my posts, you're destroying my work. Well, too bad. Um, 230C2 says they can do it. And so they're immune from liability under, under any state or federal cause of action. That's amazing. That's a lot more power than I thought they had. And I thought they had a lot of power already. One of the defenses that these companies traditionally make is that their platforms not publishers, even though all the evidence seems to show that they are actually publishers. Does that affect anything? Does that affect how the law should be applied to them? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, they are publishers. I think Twitter, Twitter and Facebook are not usually referred to as publishers because when people think of publishers, they usually think of nerds like selling book rights, right? So that's your traditional publishing house, what it looks like. But publication generally, and what we've called a publisher in the past, right? So like Gutenberg, he was a publisher, and so he just had a typeset Bible. Ben Franklin was a publisher. He published a newspaper. He had a printer. Twitter and Facebook are publishers as well in that they're providing the infrastructure for people to engage in publication, even though they may not be doing the vast majority of the publication themselves. So Twitter and Facebook undoubtedly are publishers within the plain and ordinary meaning of the word publish. And that's, that's reflected in the statute, right? So when people say, well, is it a platform or is it a publisher? Um, you know, it says here, you look at 230C1, no provider or user of a computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another. So they're doing something which is traditionally considered publication. And this section says, all right, look, we get that it's publication, but you're not going to be treated as the publisher if someone else provided that information, right? Because otherwise you'd, they'd, be, they'd have liability as a, for republishing the content. So I think that an important thing to set aside is that like the statute recognizes that Twitter and Facebook are publishers, right? In the plain and ordinary meaning of the term, they're publishers. They may not look like a publishing house, but they are. Um, going forward, I think when we look at the provision, when we look at the reform proposals that are being made, a lot of them are coming from conservatives because conservatives have really been on the receiving end of most of the, you know, quote unquote censorship that's occurred during this election cycle. And they're pretty cheesed off about it. They're not very happy. Um, so what their proposals are is that a government commission basically determines that these uh, will determine whether these platforms are politically neutral. And if they're not politically neutral, then they'll lose their protection under 230C1 from lawsuits. Uh, that's deeply problematic because what is neutral? Mean, right. So how can you determine what neutral means? Neutral is really your quality rather than a sort of abstract, definable, concrete concept. Uh, it's not a measurable quality. It's, it's an ideal. So neutrality is uh, is not really something which you can mandate in legislation, at least in any way which is legally certain. So that's the first part that, that I'd, I'd talk about there. Second, this neutrality is to be enforced by a government body, which will give out rights and privileges and immunities on the basis of whether you comply with it. And that's what we would call a constitution, <laughs> I mean, right? So if you, if you, yeah, right. So like if you, if you speak the way that we want you to speak, you will get, or if you choose to endorse the kind of speech that we want you to say, uh, then you will benefit from this immunity. And unfortunately for them, uh, that's what we would call a content-based prior restraint on speech. Uh, and as such, it's presumptively unconstitutional. And the result of a, pr a presumptively unconstitutional rule is that by default, if you sue the government, the government loses. Um, and so they would have to prove that there was a, you know, a narrowly tailored and compelling government interest and that the rule was narrowly tailored to, to address that interest. Uh, and I'm not sure that a rule which says that all companies everywhere must be politically neutral or else uh, will, will satisfy that bar. That's known as strict scrutiny review. So so that's that's really the problem. It's, it's that we have a bunch of victims of the scheme uh, who don't understand how it works or what the benefits are of having this section just because they happen to be on the receiving end of, of the, you know, the business end of it when it's being used against them. So they're, they're not seeing the benefits of which there are many. And, and, and this is, you know, 
being on the receiving end of anything is very much a time-based situation, right? You're on the receiving end today. We have no idea what happens, you know, five years from now. So sometimes, you know, you think about, well, this this isn't working out for me today. And then you you uh, turn things around and then you wake up and realize that actually if you had patience and waited five more years, you know, things might have turned around for you. Well, it's not even that. I think that they just don't understand that when you have a regime which prohibits speech or regulates speech, they don't understand what it mm-hmm. looks like. So in, in my from my point of view, I'm an English solicitor and I'm also a U.S. attorney at law. So I'm well versed in, in I like to think I'm well versed in two different legal systems that have very different approaches to the criminalization and regulation of speech. From my vantage point, I see what happens when the government decides that online platforms can't host all manner of content. And the answer is that they don't really come into existence and they have higher compliance costs. So you don't have any big British social media companies. And I think a big part of the reason is that Section 230 does not apply in England and Wales, right? So that's that's one thing. The second thing is that I've seen, I do some work with you know, interactive computer services companies, and I've seen data requests or content takedown requests come in from countries like Pakistan, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, where speech which would be allowed in the United States, but is banned in those countries, those countries decide that they want the speech to be removed. And that's scary. As an American, the idea that legal speech would come down because a police officer said, you know what, this offends the sensibilities of someone in my country. And Section 230 really allows these American companies to, you know, as long as they're in America, uh, they can tell those foreign governments to go away. They can say, listen, like we, we appreciate your point of view. We get it. There's nothing unlawful about what we're hosting here in the United States. And so unfortunately, you can go you, know, you can go pound sand. and We're not very interested in having this conversation. And that's something where it, it's, they're perfectly within their rights to do so. Right. The global law does not apply everywhere. You know, there's no such thing as global law. Rather, the law is a local phenomenon that applies in particular countries with particular geographic boundaries. And so, so the, these companies operate in the U.S. They choose to operate in the U.S. and uh, and they follow U.S. rules, and that promotes, I think, free speech everywhere because America has a very liberal free speech regime. So, in conclusion, uh, what's your opinion on two thirty? We keep it as it, you know, it's kept as it is, or you know, does it need reform? How do you? What do you think? Uh, I think we keep it exactly as is. I don't think there's anything that needs to be changed. I think that um, a lot of the concerns that people have about Section 230 would really be better addressed if they just chose to migrate platforms. Um, With virtually any uh, type of social media, there is not one operator of a service. There are certainly dominant operators. Facebook has 2 billion users. I mean, it's probably the largest in the world, Uh, but it's certainly not the only one. And, um, And so I think people need to exercise their, if they're unhappy with the choices that they've made, uh, in terms of their social platforms and the type of speech that those platforms allow, that really the only thing that a tech company understands is uh, is losing to competitors. And so I would recommend that people find, seek out those competitors and begin to use them uh, instead of using platforms uh, that that are politically opposed to to their beliefs. Thank you, Preston. That was super useful. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Great to uh, great to speak with you again. Thank you so much for listening. Like I said, I'm going to be releasing one of these every week. So make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You should also check out my YouTube channel where I'll be posting these as well as other content. See you next week.